so who is who is Professor Nidal Gesum? Professor Nidal Gesum from Algeria is an astrophysicist. Uh, well, it's very difficult to keep your your bio biography brief because of the multiple achievements. Um, I would be very embarrassed to, to leave out any of them. You received your PhD from the University of California at San Diego. Uh, since we will be talking about space and planets, maybe it's worth recalling that you spent two years as a postdoctoral researcher at uh, NASA. You have been at the American University of Sharjah in the Emirates since 2000, where you have served as a chair of the physics department, associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and president of this uh, the faculty senate. Um, Nidal Gesum is not only a scientist and a teacher, but one of the most important, if not the most important, contemporary author writing in a well-informed way uh, about the harmony of religion slash Islam and science. Not my fault. Uh, um, you have been invited to lecture at a number of prestigious places, including Cambridge, Oxford, thank you, Dean Marzouk. Um, uh, you have a strong media presence. And just to mention two books, the book uh, through which I got to know you, Islam's Quantum Question, 2011. Uh, we have a copy at the library. You can find a copy at my office, too. And uh, the most recent publication is the Young Muslim's Guide to Modern Science that I will definitely adopt in my courses at AUI and that has spared me a lot of preparation on specific topics on which uh, you are definitely more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, so today's talk okay, on the questions prepared by AUI students. Uh, but uh, I think we, we can start with, with a short uh, self-presentation, introduction. Maybe you can tell us more about Islam and science, why you decided to, to write about them. And uh, I would start actually with the most important question that uh, I get a lot in class when I start explaining your ideas. Uh, and then, uh, that then uh, students are actually too shy to ask in person when, when they see you. Because actually, uh, today we have here in Professor Gesum in person, but uh, all this started with a series of uh, Skype talks. And the question I, us I usually get uh, in my courses, uh, especially when uh, I'm explaining your position concerning miracles is, but Professor, is he a Muslim? So, Nidal, are you a Muslim? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. So that should take care of it, I guess, no? Uh, no, I think it is very interesting that this question gets asked, and uh, I think this will become uh, more and more apparent and understood what this question entails, why this question is asked. Um, and I think it says something about the Muslim mindset of today, that whenever people hear somewhat unusual ideas, and I will be stressing throughout the discussion that nothing I say touches anything in the core of Islam. But because it touches some ideas that are peripheral even to the dogmas of Islam, people jump up and say, is that Muslim? How, is he Muslim? How can he be saying that? Uh, nothing I say at all, including on the issues of miracles, on the issues of revelation, and there will be questions, pointed questions on those topics, uh, have any bearing on the core dogmas, beliefs, practice of Islam. Um, I grew up in a Muslim family. I am a practicing Muslim, not just a Muslim by, by identity, but a practicing Muslim. Um, and I tell people and they get very surprised that I have performed Hajj, I have never missed Ramadan, I pray every day. Uh, there's no need to applaud, I'm just, I'm just answering the question, it is not, I will be saying later that I am absolutely for total freedom of belief and unbelief for everybody. But because I am asked, I am just explaining that I am a practicing Muslim, um, I have some views on how to understand Islam, how to understand religion in general, how to understand spirituality, how to understand God, how to understand our existence here on earth, uh, how to 
conceptualize our existence thereafter, what kind of existence, etc., that people find a bit surprising. Uh, but that is a reflection of the fact that they have not been exposed to the whole richness of the Islamic spectrum of ideas. Um, in fact, I think 99.9% .9 of what I say is not new. It has been said in the history of Islamic ideas, of the Islamic uh, civilization and culture, but what has happened over the last few centuries, actually, is that this decline of civilization, this decline of even culture, has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed the spectrum of what we hear from Islam, what we are asked to understand of Islam, that when people hear something that is actually in the wider spectrum, they think that this is not Islam. In a way, if I want to connect it to yesterday's lecture of, of astrophysics, it is as if when people hear or um, we discuss or present some ideas of infrared radiation or ultraviolet, they say, what is that? That is not electromagnetic radiation. Just because people st start to think that only visible light is electromagnetic radiation, that even when you go to infrared and ultraviolet, let alone when you go to radio or x-ray or gamma ray or microwave, people jump up and are absolutely shocked that that is electromagnetic radiation. I tell my students, infrared, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray, all of it has absolutely no difference from visible light, except that our eyes can see that, those things. It is our eyes that cannot see. It is not that those radiations are intrinsically different from each other. They have, slight, they have different wavelengths and frequencies, but they travel at the speed of light, they are elect electric and magnetic fields that are oscillating, etc. They are exactly the same. The fact that our eyes can't see them makes us think that they are intrinsically different. So it is our projection of them being different. End of astrophysical parenthesis. It is because people have not been exposed to the entire richness of the Islamic tradition that they think that whoever thinks that miracles do not necessarily have to be supernatural, that they jump up and say, is he a Muslim? Um, so that's, that's the answer. A bit long, but uh, that's the answer. Shall we start? Let's go. So we received different questions. Uh, I just edited them a little bit for spelling mistakes, although they almost never occur in my classes. Um, and we grouped them under several headings. Uh, here we have group A, religion, science, and related questions and a bit of politics. So maybe we can read them. <coughs> or if you want. You want me to read? Yeah. Okay. Nice. And as you can see, uh, there's an ask the question. Okay, so this is from Ishraq, Hiba, Amin, and Omar. We know that science tries to explain how the world works on the basis of laws and mathematical models, while religion gives meaning, value, and purpose to life and human beings. How are they related? Shall we combine or separate science and religion? How and why? Well, science and religion are two big magisteria, two big domains, fields of human thought and human knowledge. Uh, science tries to understand how the world functions, nature in particular, including human beings, how our bodies function, how our brains function, how our minds function. Uh, in fact, the most the highest, perhaps most difficult topic of science investigation nowadays known as the heart problem is the question of consciousness. So even consciousness is addressed by science. Religion tries to tell people uh, that there is another element, another dimension to humans, uh, spirituality, that we have a spirit or a soul. There's a slight difference between the two, but that's not an issue here. Uh, and that there is some connection to a higher level of existence, uh, the divine, supernatural uh, worlds, and it is up to people to believe that there is such a dimension, spirit, spirituality, God, the divine, and so forth, or not to believe. If you believe, then you have to try to put all of this together. Now, um, there is complementarity between the two. There are different modes of, and that I think is why Ian Barber is put on the screen, Ian Barber is famous to have put his typology of relations between science and religion. Four modes, four possible modes according to Ian Barber. Uh, conflict, independence, dialogue, 
integration. So these are the four possible ways that science and religion could relate to one another according to Ian Barber. I have written and uh, insisted that the in, in the Islamic context in particular, uh, one should try to propose a harmonization model instead of a dialogue or integration. But the point is there are different modes in which science and religion can relate to each other. Um, however, they have different um, modes of operation, they have different methodologies, and we need to make sure that we never allow one to impose or interfere into the other's business. In other words, when I'm trying to do my science, I don't want anybody to come and tell me what his or her religion, because we have to understand that there's going to be thousands, if not millions, of ways to conceptualize spirituality, religion, God, etc. So whose religion am I going to listen to when I'm trying to do astrophysics, etc.? Those of you who attended my talk yesterday and discussion and Q&A, uh, remember that even when I was talking about, for example, the search for life, the possibility of existence of life on other planets, uh, how life would have developed or evolved on Mars or elsewhere, or on Europa, or on exoplanets, etc., not at a single moment in my hour and a half or two hours that I was here did I invoke religion or Islam or God or spirituality or any of that, because that is the domain of science and science has to be free and independent and not allow anybody to come in and say, you can say this, you cannot say that, or give you predetermined answers to begin with. Likewise for, we'll get to that toward the end, evolution and other topics like that. Likewise, science cannot go and start telling people, you must believe this or you must not believe that. If that is in the realm of spirituality and belief, then that is a completely di uh, different and independent realm of, of thinking. However, because both of them address human beings, science tells me, what I am, what I am, not who I am, what I am, what kind of uh, organism I am, how I have come to be, what I am, how I function, how my brain functions, and what exists around me and how to interact with the rest of the environment and nature. But religion also tells me who I am and why I am here and what happens to me when I die and how I interact with the divine or God or spirit or other human beings and other believers and other faiths, etc., etc., there is clearly a point of inter, inter, intersection between the two, and that is human beings. So I have to find a way to put the two of them into my brain in a way that is not schizophrenic. I cannot be a scientist in the morning and then in the evening I'm a, I'm a believer, or on Friday I am a Muslim and then on Sunday I have to be Christian, and then on Monday I have to be a scientist and on Tuesday I take my day off, right? So we cannot do that. So we have to find a way to harmonize all of that. And that is the purpose of all my writings, books, not me, but many, many other people in the Islamic tradition contemporary or past and in other faiths today and past. Yes? All right, so Galilei pointed out, oh sorry, it's from Nadir, uh, Sukaina, Lamia, Fatima, Zahra. Galilei pointed out that the Bible teaches how the heavens go. Galilei is the father of modern science as far as its method, method is concerned, but is his teaching concerning sacred scripture and science still valid as well? Does it apply to Islam? Can a scientist be inspired in their scientific enterprises by supernatural narratives, as Saeed Nursi, the famous Turkish thinker, claimed? There's a number of issues here, and I want to go a bit fast so we, I don't spend two hours answering the questions. We do want to leave some time for Q&A at the end. First of all, Galilei is not, is not, should not be referred to as the father of modern science. He contributed hugely, significantly, but there are others who were precursors, including and in particular Ibn al-Haytham. Um, what Galilei contributed most notably is the mathematization, if you like, of, of physics uh, and showing that mathematics is the language of physics and science. 
uh, and the experimentation, and he was you know, strong on let's do the measurement of the kinematics and all of that. Uh, but if you look at the, read at the writings and the experiments and, and the methodology of Ibn al-Haytham, for example, in optics in particular, you find very strong empirical methodology. Anyway, so that's, that's not our main concern. Um, so if we take this as Galileo's methodology of how to understand science and religion, we can call this the independence model uh, or independence mode from uh, Ian Barber, as I mentioned earlier. Or more contemporary, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, the NOMA, the famous NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria, that these are two big domains and they have to be kept separate and independent and nobody should try to put them together. That's Stephen Jay Gould, the late great uh, evolutionary biologist. Um, there are other modes, as I said, there are other modes of dialogue, some have said integration, um, but in addition to the independence, and there are people today who claim that, there, that these two are in conflict and that one of them needs to triumph, and <laughs> according to these thinkers, preferably science. Um, I have also mentioned briefly earlier that my preferred approach or preferred mode of thinking of how science and Islam in particular can relate, can relate is to try to harmonize the two in a way that preserves the uh, intrinsic methodology, methodology of each, but also recognizes that there are uh, areas where the two are in close contact, if not in uh, sort of s trying to say uh, diff things on the same topic. So for example, uh, on topics of origins, for example, uh, origins of the, of the entire universe or the world, the origins, origin of life, origins of human beings, uh, both science and religion, scriptures, say, say a number of things. So how do we harmonize the two? Uh, there are topics relating to the mind, to consciousness, to may, some may say spirit or, or soul, which sometimes is identified as the highest level of consciousness. So science is trying to explain what consciousness is. Religion says something about consciousness and uh, a spirit, spirit or spirituality. Can the two um, collaborate in a way or say things that do not uh, conflict with each other? So there are areas, a number of areas, where the two have to uh, come in contact and, and have some dialogue at least or maybe uh, uh, talk to each other. Now I'm not sure what in this question is meant by supernatural narratives. Uh, that is a bit of a strange phrase for me, uh, and how a scientist can be inspired by super, supernatural narratives. However, let me tell you how a scientist can be inspired uh, by religion, or how, a, how religion can be inspired by science. So, for example, in the Quran, we have a number of verses that invite us to contemplate, invite us to even search. Uh, in Arabic, if you want me to cite, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ بَدَأَ الْخَلْقِ and in the, in, the famous, in the famous verse of Al-Imran, uh, Al There are many, many verses that invite, encourage the believer to go and search and explore and, and, and try to understand. Hundreds of verses of that kind. And in fact, somebody like Al-Biruni, Al-Biruni is one of my great heroes of the Islamic Golden Age, Al-Biruni has written and said explicitly, he was one of the greatest scientists, a very solid, rigorous methodology, he had you know, fantastic correspondence with Ibn Sina, the great Ibn Sina, and Al-Biruni in the end, sort of almost, uh, almost, I hesitate to say blows him away, but shows him how the rigor, in the end he tells him, I think I understand the difference between me and you. You think as a philosopher, excuse me, Stefano, and I think as a scientist. And that, I think, is the first time that somebody says it so clearly and understand, in, in essence, because he tells him, you are a deductivist, you think top down, and I am an inductivist, I think bottom up. Uh, so Al-Biruni, with the science and clarity that he had, writes very explicitly that it is the verses of the Quran that have pushed me to try to make all the discoveries that I have tried to make in geology, in astronomy, in, in physics, and so on and so forth. Likewise, when in science we uh, discover, and that is why earlier over lunch I was asked, so what is your favorite field and topic since you are, seem to be multidisciplinary, etc. And I said, oh, astronomy, but hands down, I don't even have to think. 
because it is so fascinating and because it just blows you away. Uh, when, you, when you consider astronomy, and I could give a whole talk on the awe and wonder that astronomy gives you, and that even some atheists have referred to as a spiritual experience. There are now today people who refer to themselves as spiritual atheists, if you can believe that. Because science, astronomy, uh, biology, the nano world just gives you this sense of, I am looking at something that is just incredible, totally incredible. Anyway, so I think that is uh, a clear, constructive, collaborative way in which science and religion can be mutually inspiring. Let's move on. It gets tougher, I'm sure. Okay, from Badr and Yunus, in a 2008 article, you observed that millions of people refer to the Quran daily to justify their aspirations or to explain their actions. We wonder whether sometimes we are not relying on referring to Islam to make decisions in fields that shouldn't involve religion in the first place. Furthermore, religion is taught in a number of ways that involve not only families, but also the educational system, high school, in which one is not really given a chance, but to learn about Islam. What is your take on this? Should religion be kept personal? Should it be taught at school? Shouldn't we, uh, shouldn't we give our children a choice to choose their own religion? A chance, sorry, a chance, a chance, a chance? A choice, it says. A chance to choose, okay. Um, I said earlier that uh, science and religion have their own fields. They sometimes come in contact on some issues that they both try to say something and we need to make sure that it is harmonized and not somebody imposing or some, somebody. But I said earlier that as a scientist, I don't want somebody to come and tell me what I should research or what my conclusions should be even before I have done the research. So yes, religion um, must not interfere in where it has no business interfering. There is no doubt. And likewise, I said earlier that science has no right to come and dictate uh, the beliefs of people whenever those beliefs are not. Uh, so you cannot have people who come and tell you, yes, but the Quran says that the sun goes around the earth. I say, excuse me, that's not your problem. That is astronomy. That's my concern. You have no right to tell me. Um, and likewise. So I agree that religion sometimes is made to... Um, say some things or apply its ideas or principles where it shouldn't be. However, however, on the question of education, um, parents have the right, now we can discuss, is it the parents' right, have the right to teach their, their children what they see fit to teach them. In the United States and in a number of countries, uh, uh, parents are allowed to homeschool their children and teach them whatever they like until the age of 17 or 18 and then they take whatever exam and go to any university they want to go to. So nobody tells them how come you are teaching them X or Y or you're not teaching them y, uh, Z and T. So uh, it is widely recognized and understood that parents have the right to teach their children what they like. Parents have the right to put their children in any school they like and they could be religious schools, so some, some parents take their children and put them in Catholic schools, or put them in Islamic schools, even in the West, or put them in secular schools, or put them in um, uh, American schools, or whatever schools. So the schooling of children and what they should learn is widely understood to be the parents' choice. Now, suppose we, all of us as parents, suppose we are all parents, and we all agree, by some miracle, we all agree that our children should be going to Islamic schools. Let's assume, okay? Then there is an Islamic school and we send our children to Islamic schools. Nobody's going to object because we all agree and nobody's going to be shocked. So if a community agrees that here's what we should be teaching our children, then that's what will go, what's going to happen. So nobody should be shocked as to how come our children are being taught religion at school. If now the community decides that no, we should not, teach religion in school, this is a private matter, it should be taught at home or kept for the evening 
madrasa or, or uh, Sunday church or whatever it is, then the community will say religion will not be taught at school. This is what happens, for example, in France or happens in a number of countries. This is a private matter. It should be taught elsewhere. So the point I'm trying to make is it is the parents and, by extension, the community that decides what the children should be, should be taught. Now, if some parents disagree with the community, then they should have the right to take their children to any other school that doesn't teach whatever that community has decided to do. But we should not be so shocked at how come and how come. In fact, what I think we should be, we should be asking is how come we are not teaching our children more religions or other viewpoints and other faiths? Not how come our children are taught so much Islam in school, what we should be asking is how come our children are not being given more knowledge about other religions and other traditions? Look, if tomorrow there's going to be uh, a seminar or a public lecture about Buddhism, even though tomorrow I'll be flying back, I would love to go and attend. Wouldn't you all want to go and attend? I want to learn. Don't you all want to, uh, to learn? Of course we all want to learn. Now, last part. Uh, isn't, shouldn't the children be given the choice to learn religion or not religion? No, children don't have any understanding and any wisdom to be told, would you like to learn about religion? Can you imagine going to your four-year-old or five-year-old and say, um, we have the choice between sending you to a, a, a school that teaches religion in, a, in addition to everything else and sending you to a school that doesn't teach religion but only everything else, what would you like to do? Can you imagine that? Of course not. Uh, now, when the children grow up and become adults, they should have the freedom to do whatever they want with their minds, whatever they want. Believe, not believe, go to whatever university they want to go to, and as I said the other day, follow your heart, choose any major you want to, to major in. Um, Decide whatever you want to decide. And then, should religion be personal? Of course religion should be personal. Nobody should come to anybody and say, how come you believe this? How come you don't believe that? You have no right. Uh, we should not have any inquisition. Inquisition should be long gone. Nobody should come into the mind or heart or anybody and say, why are you believing this or not believing that? Uh, did you pray today? Did you go to this? Uh, did you really fast today? Did you not? Uh, that, of course religion is a personal matter. But if the community decides that we are going to adopt um, some, some curriculum or some social norms or whatever, then it is the, the community to decide. Done? Okay. It gets even harder, I'm sure. Yes, but uh, let me do some work for you. Okay. Um, so we have a yeah, question read. from... Yes, I'll read. Um, from Taha Ahmed Khalil, Anas Nassim. Um, in class, we were reading, maybe you can help me too, by okay. holding the book. Um, in your interview with Stephen Paulson, you gave your interpretation of Revelation. Quote, uh, no, Revelation was probably some kind of inspiration. Muhammad had reached a certain spiritual level. His spirit opened up. There was some connection to the other dimension of reality that we can't we can touch and describe scientifically. Something happened so that he started to perceive certain truths and morals and he put them into sentences. Now, it's up to the believer to decide whether that what, uh, was this dictated to him from on high or whether there was some participatory element in this experience, end quote. I hope you recognize yeah, of yourself. Course. Um, students say, this is your opinion on Revelation, which we respect. However, to a previous question asked by Paulson about whether the Quran was the literal word of God or not, you replied that in Islam, Muhammad did not compose it and teach it to his followers. By it, we mean the Quran. No, it's letter to letter, by word by word, the revelation of God. We seem to feel a tension here. Is the Quran, in your opinion, the literal word of God, or did the Prophet formulate his perception, perceptions in two sentences? I told you to. I thought we agreed that you would be taking the hard questions. Uh, isn't that why you're wearing a tie? Uh, <laughs> All right, so this, this is the passage in this famous interview with Steve Paulson. Um, Steve Paulson is a brilliant uh, interviewer. 
Uh, this was an interview that I did with him on NPR something like seven years ago or something. Uh, and he liked it so much that he decided that he wanted it in his book here, which was conversation with a number of uh, philosophers and thinkers, etc., on science and religion. Anyway, um, there is one sentence uh, that was left out of this, um, and, that, and it is the sentence that comes before this, Muhammad didn't compose it and teach it, etc. What I told Steve Paulson, this is all written anyway, is that in the Islamic, uh, I, don't, I hesitate to call it orthodox tradition, or standard version of Islam that we are all taught, and I said, in fact, in the text, I said 99%, and then I corrected myself, I said 99.99% of Muslims believe that the Quran is letter to letter, word to word, the uh, revelation from God, that it was dictated from on high. And I said, but it is not the only possible conception of revelation, that there is another way to conceptualize it, and that is that the Prophet, والسلام, peace be upon him, had reached this highest spiritual level, and that he established contact with God. When he established contact with God, there was this channel of communication. Now, this channel of communication now, which we refer to as wahi, revelation, now starts to transfer some data, if you like, in today's parlance, and then it is formulated in human language. You have to underline and remember. This is human language. Arabic is a human language with all its imperfections as every other language, okay? Now, that formulation into the Arabic language, was that God making the formulation or was it this transfer process that formulated this into some Arabic text? And I said, and it is quoted here, it is up to the believer to conceptualize this revelation as top-down or bottom-up or some kind of a mutual channel. Where is the tension and the, you know, the, is he a Muslim uh, in, in all this? I reminded also, this is also in the text, and I, I hope that people, when they read texts, they read them carefully and in full and quote them faithfully. This is what we teach our students, right? I said to Steve Paulson, and this is written, I said, what we know from the seerah, from the history of the prophethood, is that way before he started receiving revelation, he started undergoing this process, he spent months and years going up to the cave and coming back down and noticing some signs and going through a long process where he was growing spiritually. Why would, we ha would he have to go through months and years of up and down to the cave, spending nights alone and seeing things and realizing that something is happening to him, etc., if it was not this spiritual growth and spiritual awakening? Why? If God wanted to just catch him and dictate some things like, hey, sit down, here's the text, write it down, then, then there's no need for all this. So my point is, Go back and read the whole tradition of Islam. Don't get shocked just because you're hearing something for the first time. This is in Sirat Ibn Hisham, by the way. I'm not telling you something that is written in some fringe, fringe book. This is in the standard classical uh, history of the prophethood, before and after. By the way, there's a fantastic book by Riza Aslan, No God But God. Read, please, if I can advise you, go get it. If it's not in the library, I advise the library to get 10 copies of it. Reza Aslan, No God But God. It is a fantastic book on the history of Islam from before the prophethood all the way to the attempts at reform of the early 20th century. When you read that whole thing, and of course I understand, you are all... 20 something, maybe even younger than 20, and I am 57, so of course I have had w time and space and, and, and travel to read all kinds of stuff, and so I'm not, I'm, for me it's like when I read these things, it doesn't shock me because I know, I'm aware of all this. You are shocked because this is the first time you hear any such thing, and for you this is absolutely shocking. It is not shocking, this is part of our tradition. 
Let's move on. So next question posed by Zainab with A. Kauter, Hamza, and uh, yeah, I always misspell that name. I should apologize. And Zakaria. In your interview with Paulson, um, you were asked about the revelation that you interpreted as spiritual experience while insisting on its non-supernatural aspect. You specified his, the prophet's spirit opened up. There was some connection to the other dimension of reality that we can't describe scientifically. Our question is, how can it be that you see the prophet's experience as non-supernatural, yet discuss the event as a connection to another reality science can't comprehend? Does it mean that you see this other reality as natural? I think there's a big misunderstanding here. I never said non-supernatural anywhere. None. In fact, it says very clearly, it's a spiritual experience. I just explained to you in a few sentences what I wrote, and it is all uh, published, and you can go back to it. I never said non-spiritual, non-supernatural. Non uh, I said it is spir spiritual, it is another dimension of our existence, it is not natural, it cannot be described by scientific uh, methodology. It is a, a different uh, dimension of reality, if you like, capital R, reality. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure there is an issue here to begin with, really. Um, there are, look, the way I describe it to people, the way I represent it to simplify is the natural world, imagine the natural world as the two-dimensional uh, horizontal world, okay? Length and width. This is natural world. Spiritual world is, is, a, is the third dimension perpendicular to it, okay? They intersect here at humans. So we're the intersection of spirituality, this is the vertical dimension, so to speak, metaphorically of course, and the horizontal two-dimensional world of, uh, of nature, of science, of physics and physicalism, if you like. Okay? So, do they intersect? Yes, of course they intersect in us, at least this is how we believers understand spirit, spirituality, existence, and so forth, and the uh, natural world. Now, this revelation is not something in the horizontal world that should be an, uh, explored or, or described scientifically naturally. It is in this vertical world. So I, I don't think there is an issue there, really, unless I misunderstood the question or something. But l maybe the person can, can, can come back later and follow up. I'll be happy to, to address. Good. Um. Salima Kenza Zainab Khaliriyad Wiyam, as he interpreted the Quranic revelation as the prophet connecting to another dimension of reality, we would like to know Dr. Gisum's opinion about life after death. If he believes that Edith would be that would be another dimension of reality as well, and we will develop our question by asking him about his perception of heaven, death, the torture of the grave. Yeah. Um. Al-Ghazali is famous for having uh, faulted the philosophers on 20 issues, three of which he declared them heretical over, right? Um, the three are the uh, eternal world or universe, uh, two, the uh, non-physical resurrection, and the third, uh, non-knowledge of the particular as, as, as it was referred to at the time. So, the philosophers, Al-Farabi, Al-Kindi, Ibn Sina, um, did not believe that our bodies get resurrected, that only our souls, and that what happens after death is a purely uh, spirit or spiritual uh, spirit matter uh, issue. I shouldn't say matter, so we don't get confused. Uh, only spiritual and soul-related life. Al-Ghazali, of course, was very upset over this because how can you say that when the Quran keeps talking about all kinds of pleasures in heaven and all kinds of physical punishment in hell? You know, you get burned and your flesh happens to this and there's fire and, and etc., etc. And in heaven, of course, there's all kinds of descriptions. There's the, the rivers and the, and the fruits and uh, whatever you like, right? Um, now, this is, again, going to shock you, but uh, again, this is part of our heritage and our all Islamic golden age. You will find this in books and books and books. Um, that people have discussed uh, whether the hereafter, al-akhirah, 
uh, should be physical or not. And the philosophers were not just stupid. Of course, they had read the Quran. They knew the Quran backward and forward. Of course, they knew that the Quran talks about you know, physical pleasures and physical punishment. But they thought about it and they said, yeah, but if that's going to be the case, then it means that over there, there has to be some water, there has to be some air, there has to be some ground that grows the strawberry or whatever you prefer, uh, and there has to be some oxygen to allow the fire to burn, and there has to be some fuel, there has to be some wood or some oil, and so on and so forth. In other words, there's going to be another Earth. So are we going from Earth to another Earth? And they thought, that doesn't make sense, because Earth is by definition, in a rem re reminder, in the old ancient uh, division, Earth is the corrupt world, right? Whatever was sublunar was the corrupt world, because things rot, things uh, uh, get uh, corrupted in every way. Whereas in the heavens, it, was, it used to be thought, heavens are perfect, right? Everything goes in circles, and it's beautiful, and, it's, and these are crystal balls, and da, da, da. So they thought, if we're going to go from Earth to another Earth, then that's, that's problematic, because what kind of afterlife, eternal, beautiful, where nothing, nothing, nothing gets rotten or nothing gets broken, etc., has to have water flowing and has to have oxygen and has to have fire burning, and, and etc., etc. And, and our bodies, and why should we have our bodies? Why would I need my body to have, to have pleasure? He said, but the greatest pleasures are spiritual pleasure to begin with, right? The other day, I don't know who I was with when we said, uh, I think it was with Omar when we said, uh, in the afterlife, we hope that God will just give us plenty of books. <laughs> it was with you. Yeah, and I hope that I stay with Stefano also over there. And all of you, maybe. We have some of that, yeah. Uh, well, some books are better than others, so we have to be careful which books. Um, Anyway, so the point is, um, physical pleasure is only simplistic pleasure. It's only, uh, you know, your first level of pleasure. After a while, you, you get tired of the, of the physical pleasure. Um, and so the philosophers, to make a long story short, the philosophers concluded that the Quran is only explaining or telling this for the people who only aim that far. Those who want to aim much higher will understand that these are only uh, ways to attract the believer or to encourage him or her to act right. But in the end, the pleasures are going to be unimaginable and not what you have imagined. And that can only be if your souls are going to be experiencing that, not your bodies, because your bodies are, to begin with, flawed and limited. So, to, mark, to make a long story short, um, is it such, so shocking to say, um, yeah, in the afterlife, our bodies are not going to be resurrected? Is that part of the Islamic creed or the Islamic dogma? Did anybody tell you that if you do not believe that your body is going to be resurrected, you are not a Muslim? No. It does not exist in any of the creeds. Um, now, Al-Ghazali, Al -Ghazali, I don't know if he was really adamant about it or he just wanted to close the door. Um, didn't want that kind of talk because he maybe felt that this is a slippery slope or because it would, you know, open the door to all kinds of um, heretical ideas, etc. But I personally don't get shocked with any of that. So, when we die, our souls and spirits remain and continue and go on. Uh, and with that, you can think of what happens in your grave and what happens in, on the Day of Judgment and so on and so forth. Are we done with Paulson? Not yet. Okay, so Not this, yet. So um, all of this is because of that interview that I gave to Steve Paulson seven years ago. I'll tell Steve Paulson, you, he got me into so much trouble. Ayub, Khawla, Yasmin, Iman. Okay. We read your, meanwhile, very famous uh, <laughs> interview with Paulson regarding your views about miracles, as well as your point of view about the miracle of the splitting of the moon in Islam's quantum question, the first pages. Uh -huh. You pointed out that the miraculous narrative of the moon splitting in the Quran might be referring to future events. Could such an event then violate the laws of nature? Also, you argue that uh, the moon splitting could be nothing but a meteoroid hitting the surface of the moon. At the same time, a, a similar story that happened in uh, 1178 
is explained by meteoroid hitting the moon as well. However, scientists have remarked that such events happen every few millions of years. Isn't there an inconsistency tension here, mm -hmm. Nidal? Okay. So, um, again, I am not the first person to have uh, mentioned, including in the entire Islamic history, that this moon splitting uh, may very well not have happened physically. In fact, never happened or is something that may happen in the future or is just meant as, uh, as a lesson or, a, or a, maybe a metaphor or something. I'm not the first one to say anything like that. Secondly, secondly, I pointed out in the first few pages of Islam's Quantum Question that this story of the splitting of the moon also exists in at least two other cultures of very different times, very different times. Australia, in, in, in Great Britain or in England, and in Arabia, at very different times, okay? It doesn't mean that really the moon split three times or that something happened. By the way, there are many, many, and as an astronomer and, uh, and uh, an amateur of history of science, I know that there's all kinds of events that people relate, events or some phenomena that happen in the sky, celestial events uh, that people describe in certain ways and then later we realize it didn't happen that way. It couldn't have happened that way. People misperceived it. People got so impressed when a comet passes. Oh, when solar eclipses happen. There have been so many solar eclipses. There's typically a few a year solar eclipses and from time to time, on average, wherever you live on average, once every 30 years or so you get a solar eclipse. So people in their lands were getting solar eclipses every now and then. And they would get completely scared and they would tell stories about what happened during solar eclipses, etc., etc. So that people tell you the moon split does not mean that the moon split, okay? So we, get to, uh, we need to understand this. this is th that's what I was trying to explain. Secondly, I said that there are simple explanations as to what could happen on the moon that would give certain flash that gives the impression to people, oh, the moon looks like it split today. Uh, the moon didn't split, there was just a flash. How could there be this flash? By the way, up to today, there are some amateurs who sometimes take pictures and they see flashes, small flashes, on the moon. Today, amateurs do this, okay? Because they keep watching the moon and because they have time and they have cam good cameras nowadays and good telescopes, etc. So we get these flashes on the moon from time to time. Not huge, but if there is a big meteoroid that comes and hits the surface of the moon and it, uh, produces such a big flash, then for a few seconds it looks like, you know, the, especially the astronomers will tell you if the moon at that time is a crescent and it gets hit on the edge and then it looks like the edge or the, the, the uh, how do you say, the, the end of the, of the crescent gets broken, it looks like it is broken. Now, and the astronomers will tell you that this kind of spectacular event happens on average every one or two million years. So now our friends, Ayyub and Khawla and Yasmin and Iman are saying, so how could you be saying it happens once every million years and then at the same time telling us it happened three times over a thousand years? First of all, I'm not saying it happened three times over a thousand years. I'm saying this is what people related, okay? Secondly, even if it really happened, let's assume that these guys really saw something that is exactly that kind of meteoroid that hit the moon, etc., etc. When we tell you that the frequency of an event is once every million years, it means on average. Uh, so if I tell you, for example, there is some phenomenon that happens in the sky once every 10 years, okay? It doesn't mean that every 10 years regularly you will get that thing. You could have, you could have, oh, let's say, for example, if I say, how often do you get snow, two days, a snowstorm at the end of March? You say, well, uh, end of March, snowstorm for two days once every five years or something. Does that mean that we got it this year, we cannot get it next year? Of course not. It just means on average, if I look for 50 year period, I will find it about 10 times. But it doesn't mean every five years exactly. So to make a long story short, look, there is absolutely no reason to think that this moon splitting is a miraculous event. By the way, there are a number of other physicists, I swear, not me, okay, other physicists. Muslim physicists that I know, devout Muslims, okay, who have pointed out that if this had broken up, if the moon had broken up really, 
and had reassembled only 1,400 years ago, there will be all kinds of uh, lasting, lasting consequences, such as seismic activity, such as volcanic activity on the moon, such as some magnetic because the mantle and whatever is inside the moon would still be, would still be boiling or, or shaking or whatever. There would be all kinds of consequences which nobody has ever measured. By the way, that picture yeah, is what... Nidal, I'm sorry to interrupt and contradict you, long. but oh. uh, Professor Zaghlul El-Najjar, or El-Nagar, who is a geologist, has published a very clear picture taken by NASA, supposedly, that demonstrates the splitting of the moon. I'm, of of course, referring to the second one. Yeah. The, the first one is Photoshop, but the second one is not. How do you explain that? Yeah, so uh, this is called a rill. I explained this in very briefly in the book. This is called a rill. Do you know how many rills like this there are on the moon? There are dozens, hundreds of rills like this. These rills are limited, limited sort of uh, canyons, if you like. They are from a few kilometers to a few hundred kilometers long. By the way, the circumference of the moon, circumference of the moon is roughly, roughly, um, let me count, 20,000 kilometers. No, 10,000 kilometers. Circumference, okay? So a few hundred kilometers, a real, a canyon like this, which by the way is only deep to a few hundred meters, not something that really split the moon completely from, from side to side and from one end to another. This is a canyon, a canyon. There are all kinds of canyons. And there's all kinds of geological, if you like, or moonological, <laughs> we should say, uh, explanations to how these come about. There are many, many of them. But there was this spectacular picture that was taken by, I think it was Apollo 8 or something, uh, that when people found it said, oh, Allahu Akbar, uh, we have found the proof. But that, is, that just, just shows you that people are not rigorous, systematic in their science research. Anybody, you, any one of you, forget Professor X, any one of you could go to the internet, research this for half an hour and find exactly what this is and conclude after half an hour, this cannot be a splitting of the moon. Please. Okay, next question, Saad, Iman, Ahmed, Ayman, Asma. What happens if science at some point can demonstrate or explain a phenomenon that has always been interpreted as a miracle with religious significance? For instance, at some point, we can find an explanation of how a stuff like Moses one can turn into a snake. Uh, parallel question, Omar, Ajar, Maryam, al Haytham, and Ma'in. Do you assume that anything that is supernatural for instance, the moon splitting is beyond God's power. And if not, why would God not suspend his laws since he's capable of everything? First of all, I have never said or written anywhere that anything is beyond God's power, natural or supernatural. I don't know where that second statement comes from. Do you assume that anything that is supernatural, such as the moon splitting? By the way, I just explained that there is no reason to believe that this moon splitting was uh, supernatural is beyond, nothing is beyond God's power, okay? Let's put this uh, squarely uh, aside. Never have I said anything like that. Secondly, can God suspend the laws of the universe and do whatever he pleases at any moment? Absolutely. Can he do that? Of course he can. He is God by, by definition, omnipotent, omniscient, uh, infinite in everything. How can I, me, little, limited, stupid guy, tell God what he can and cannot do? Really? I mean, just, let's just understand our dogmas. God is, by definition, infinite in everything. Okay? Impossible for me to even imagine or comprehend or define. So I cannot say he, it is beyond, nothing is beyond him. Now, what is my understanding of how God created the world and how God Re, uh, uh, relates to the world and what he does. You, at least those of you who are taking or have taken Stefano's class, have read Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan's, and his idea is that because God created the laws of the universe, and because we know that the universe functions under the laws, there is regularity, there is predictability, there is repeatability, there is 
everything is regular and the laws of the universe. I don't have to even think twice to know that if I drop this, it will fall and break. Yes? Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan says that is God's covenant. That is God's promise and he keeps his promise that the world will function that way. Now, could he, if he decided at some point, do something? Do you know, for example, is God absolutely just? Yes. Can God decide not to be just toward anybody or, any, or anything? In principle, yes. Does he ever do that? No. In fact, we have clear hadith Qudsi that God says, I have forbidden that on myself to be unjust. Does it mean he cannot? No. It means that he has decided that he will not do what is unjust. Likewise, I believe and many Muslims believe that God has decided on himself that he will let the laws of the universe function because then humans can really function. Otherwise, if I have no idea what will happen in five minutes, things will start to jump up and down. And then, I don't know, some magnetic field will go crazy, and then the lights will start to become X-rays and gamma rays, and we all get mutations, etc. Then I cannot function as a human being. I cannot function. I cannot function as a human being, let alone as a scientist, if there is no repeatability, if there is no predictability of the universe. Okay? So that's the idea of, of understanding what, it, what happens in the universe, in nature, in terms of phenomena in terms of phenomena. Now, does that mean that tomorrow God will decide that, hey, whatever Nidal told you yesterday is, does, is, does not impose on me, I can decide to do whatever? Yes, of course, God can do. But I am absolutely convinced that God, because he wants me to really trust in him, will not do that. And so there will not be tomorrow, that is my conviction, but hey, I'm, an, I'm a human being, I'm open-minded, I know I get things wrong all the time. So I could be wrong, but I am absolutely convinced that I am not. Um, there will not be tomorrow a process by which a staff becomes a snake. So what happened in that story? So is it important for you that the staff became a snake or the lesson and the event that transpired out of that that is related to us thousands of years later? So it is just like if I'm pointing to that and you keep looking at my finger, right? So is it important that I am pointing to something or that I want you to look at my finger? That's the idea. It is what is the moral lesson. Look, every time you read in the Quran a story or the description of a cosmic or natural phenomenon, ask yourself, what is the lesson? Not what is the physical mechanism? Once you understand that, you will see, you will have such clarity and peace of mind and heart you will not have to worry about the staff and the snake. Okay, brace yourself uh, for the next question. I can see uh, the Italy guy. Yeah, there. it's some independent student whose name is Stef Bellitali, typical uh, Moroccan name. Uh, yeah. um, his question, mm -hmm. I received it via email. What are the major fallacies or weak points of the whole discourse, exegetical trend about the so-called scientific miracles of the Quran? Because we have supernatural miracles and we have the so, or what is translated into English as scientific, scientific miracles. That is, for those who are not familiar with it, the idea that the Quran contains accurate, precise, that's the word, scientific information that has only been verified centuries after the revelation. And as... Uh, Example of the trend, uh, if you want to hold it, speaking of books. I'm not too happy to be holding this up. Okay. But um, can one believe in Ijaz? Maurice Pikai, for those who haven't seen, this is Maurice Pikai's face. Yes. Can one believe in Ijaz, uh, classically defined as the inimitability of the Quran's beauty, content, etc., without believing in Ijaz al Ilmi, the scientific inimitability? And Nidal, are there any true scientific miracles according to this definition. <coughs> yeah, so let's begin with the last one. So as a, as a real scientist, if somebody makes a claim, I have to go and check, right? I cannot just say, no, 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 that cannot be true. I'm done. I'm not even going to check. So I go and check, and I have done that. Those of you who have read my book, or at least the chapter on Ijaz Ilmi in the book, will find many examples. Uh, 
including all the spectacular examples of how the speed of light was derived from verses of the Quran and how all the embryology was, was presumably found in the Quran and uh, the geology and the Big Bang and, uh, and dark matter and you name it. Yeah? All of that is in there. There is not a single example that with, can withstand scrutiny, real methodological, methodical, um, rigorous scrutiny. So, uh, open-minded, neutral, uh, okay, what do I know? I don't have to judge, prejudge, let me go and check. So, if somebody gives me an example, I go and scrutinize it. I say, mm, sorry, doesn't work. Then look at another one, oh, sorry, doesn't work. Look at another one. So that's the first thing. Secondly, um, is the Quran really uh, a book of science and the science of only, remember, 20th century, not the science of the 19th century or the science of the 22nd century. Just so happens that the science that we discovered in late second half of 20th century and early 21st century is found in the Quran. It's like, yeah, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Uh, why would the Quran contain these hidden scientific truths that become only uh, apparent and only to some scholars in late 20th century, early 21st century? That, that the whole premise is suspicious to begin with. Then you ask yourself, what was the purpose of the Quran to begin with? What is the point of this whole message? Why do we have this religious spiritual, divine, sacred book? Is it to tell me about, uh, let's see, some um, neutron stars? Just to connect with yesterday's lecture. Neutron stars in the Quran, black holes in the Quran. I'm not making this up, by the way. There's references and they are all footnoted in the book. Why would the Quran want to really tell me about black holes? Again, as I said earlier, ask yourself, what is the lesson? Why would the Quran want to tell me about black holes and tell me about the black holes in really sort of hidden, mysterious way that you have to really dissect the words and go back to the old classical books of linguistic to really figure out that this phrase here is referring to black holes. The whole thing really doesn't just doesn't stand up at all from every angle, from um, the methodological angle, from the content angle, from the historical angle. Oh, and by the way, how come nobody in the entire Islamic civilization ever had such in inclination of, let's go in the, um, in the Quran and see if we can find some good geology? Nobody did. None. You will not find. From Biruni, whom I said is one of my biggest heroes, to, uh, to Ibn al-Haytham, whom I mentioned earlier as also my other hero, to all the great thinkers, etc. Nobody. Or even try to find even some, some medicine in the Quran. None. None. Enough said. Oh. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. So, yeah. So... What is referred to here as i'jaz is this, sometimes, sometimes translated as inimitability. That the Quran is inimitable, that you, nobody can produce another Quran. Because this is, this is found in the Quran in at least two places where um, God says, they will not be able to produce another Quran like this if they all tried. And sometimes they will not even be able to produce even one surah if they tried. So this Qur'an is uh, miraculous in that sense. Mu'jiz has some form of i'jaz that is uh, defying to humans that you could not produce something like that. And most humans, uh, uh, sorry, most Muslims, almost all Muslims, in fact, I don't know any Muslim who says uh, the Qur'an is just another text like any other text. I don't know anybody. Uh, so Muslims believe that this Qur'an is absolutely unique, absolutely special. And the only way to understand how it is unique and special is to believe that it is of divine origin, of divine origin. Uh, in fact, even many of the Orientalists, they themselves, some of them write and say, when we go and try to read the Quran, we're just completely bewildered. Like this, we can't make sense of it. 
Not that they are immediately struck that, oh, I have to believe this is a divine book, but they are just completely lost. They say, this text, I, just, I don't understand. The structure is strange. The language is strange. It jumps from one thing to another, and then it, it comes back and does this. And it's like, this is not the way we write. This is not anybody writes. It's not a poem. It's not a series of poems, it's not a, a narration, it has stories, but it has morals, but it has some, um, you know, sort of poetry-like, as we call it, call it in Arabic, there's some, you know, sort of uh, echoes in the Quran, and it's really strange, really strange for, for people who are not used to, we Muslims tend to sort of take it for granted because we were fed this Quran from day one. And so we grow up with it, and then we don't quite realize that the text is really unique. So there is this um, concept of i'jaz of the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is unique and uh, defying to human uh, production, let's say. But it is a completely different story whether this uniqueness, spectacular difference for us, divine origin has some scientific dimension to it. Yeah, that's the difference. Okay, we come to your field, astronomy. Um, Finally. No more miracles. Yeah, uh, unless. I can relax. <laughs> uh, well, we have evolution in a bit. Uh -oh. so. <laughs> um, in an article, you describe the historical development and discrepancy between the calendars designed for civil purposes only and the practice of citing the crescent on the 29th evening of the previous month. What are the reasons why religion and astronomy were not combined in one path? And maybe we can combine this question with the following too, so that you can okay. answer all of them. Okay. Um, Muad, so this was Iman Abla Malak Ashraf and Muad Ashraf Rita and Rita. You claim that Islamic countries should rely more on science and technology in order to determine the start and end of any month, most importantly Ramadan, in order to avoid conflicts. Do you think that one of the main reasons behind the fact is that Islamic countries still adopt ancient methods or rely on Quranic verses like the following? And here we have a quote, you can take it up again. Um, and Osman, I'm an uh, Maha Yasmin Reda. You point out the practical advantages of synchronizing the beginning of Ramadan based on astronomical data. Is it only a practical issue or you think that such an initiative would also help our, um, our Islamic communities to unite politically and give a brighter image of our religion? Maybe you can answer all yeah, of those. Okay. Um, so to make a long story short, um, Let's go back to the previous one here. The reason why we still have this Ramadan problem or the Islamic calendar problem uh, is not because of the verse. On the contrary, this verse states very clearly that the phases of the moon are a way to compute the times, to figure out the months and the years, etc. The reason why we have that problem is because many of the fuqaha, the Muslim jurists, insist on following the hadith, not the verse, verse or verses of the Quran, the hadith that say explicitly, watch, observe the crescent and start fasting and end fasting at the end of the month when you see the new crescent of the lunar month. And they say, we have to do that. And we tell them, we astronomers and other modernists tell them, but that was the only method that was available at that time. So what did, in fact, the hadith itself, and many of you are familiar with it, it says, نَحْنُ أُمَّةٌ أُمِّيَّةٌ لَا نَحْسَبُ وَلَا نَقْرَأْ إِشْعَارُ عِنْدَنَا هَكَذَا وَهَكَذَا We are a people who do not have knowledge of calculation. The month for us is 30 or 29. Start fasting when you see the new crescent and the fast when you see the new crescent. In other words, he was prefacing and explaining to people, because we don't know how to do the calculations, we have no choice but to go by the observation of the crescent. And I tell people, no, from everything you know about the prophet and all his, his sira, all his history and everything he did, and there are many, many instances when people went to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, I have a different 
pref better method for this or that. He always said, let's choose or let's adopt whatever is best and whatever is easier. You know better for the, your, the affairs of your world. If I went to him and I said, I have a computer program and I have some, some astronomy and I can do the calculation for you ahead of time and I will tell you when Ramadan is going to be and everybody will in, be in agreement, do you think he will say, thank you Nidal, go home, we will observe the crescent? No, he will say, fantastic, thank you, we have a good Muslim here, he's helping the community. So why do you want to insist on following, I agree, ancient methods that we have shown, I have published articles and papers on this, are unreliable, there are numerous errors. I could go on for, for hours and hours, uh, so let me not mention any country in particular, I saw the video camera up there. <laughs> and I don't mean Morocco, by the way. Uh, really not. But there is one country in particular where the rate of errors because of observing the crescent was found to be 90% over a 50-year period. Okay? So this ancient method is bad and wrong. There was no choice but to adopt it a long time ago and people went with it with whatever consequences. Now it creates, it produces errors and it creates uh, uh, strife and, and conflicts between people. There are cities, cities where people enter in conflict. I know of some cases where people in the same family started fighting because X wanted to follow the calculation and Y wanted to follow the, what the government said. Okay, so we need to stop that. Uh, and by the way, uniting or following the more correct methods is not going to make us politically united, okay? Let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> Just because I will help you start, everybody start Ramadan on the same day will not mean all the Muslim countries will be one and together. I'm not naive, okay? But let's fix at least one problem that is easy to fix, let's fix it. And it's easy to fix as long as the fuqaha and the officials, government officials, understand our logic. Good. We come to the toughest slide, a toughest slide. And um, let me remind you that Professor Violetta Cavalli Sforza is watching us. Evolution. Akram, <laughs> what is the evidence for the evolution of species or species from species? Wasim, Medi, Mansur, in the Quran there are references to the creation of Adam in heaven. If science is in complete harmony with Islam, how can we also believe that humanity is the product of evolution? In Butaina Aida, evolution is supported by plenty of proofs, but does evolution represent the essence of our existence itself? Okay. Um, Again, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say now is not new, believe it or not. In fact, it, you can find a lot of what I'm going to say going back centuries, sometimes more than a thousand years. Find it in our history, in our civilization. Some of the great thinkers were saying this already. Some of them saying that on the basis of some science, okay? Uh, evolution, the idea of evolution. Put aside Darwin's theory or Lamarck or new synthesis theory or whatever, put aside the idea that there is evolution of species, microevolution, and for a number of people throughout the ages, macroevolution, meaning from one species to another, is not new. This has existed for centuries. Darwin's uh, genius was to find the mechanisms by which this occurs, okay? Now, uh, if I had a whole semester, I could answer the first question, which is what is the evidence of evolution from one species to another, because this is a common, a common question. Yes, yes, we don't have any problem with microevolution. Of course, species or animals evolve a little bit over the ages, and you, you can find them changing because of environmental pressures or stresses, etc., etc. But where have you ever seen one species transform into another species? And by this, they mean have you ever seen um, um, a, um, uh, the, 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 wolf, the wolf transform into a dog? Which, it has, which has happened in, the, in history in the past. But they say, can you see that? Have you ever seen that? Can you have a wolf in your farm or something? And then three weeks later you come and find it to have, to have transformed into a dog? 
You say, yeah, because it doesn't happen over, over a few weeks. It happens over decades and centuries. And in some cases, it happens over thousands of years, if not millions of years, most cases. But believe it or not, and you're going to be shocked, if you go and search the scientific literature, there are some very strange small creatures that actually change significant characteristics to become different species. There's differences on definition of species, but uh, over very short periods of time over days, sometimes weeks, they do change. This exists, if you can believe that. So don't fool yourself into thinking scientists have never seen a species transform into a species. They have, many, many times. But there are strange small species that we do not deal with on our every day, in, in, on uh, uh, every day. There are all kinds of evidence. A lot of it is indirect, but it can only be explained. There's all kinds of observations. Look, and we, in science, I tell my students, look, science, 95% of the evidence for any phenomenon in science is indirect, not direct. Now, so my simple examples, because I teach astronomy and astrophysics and physics, etc., and I tell students, uh, anybody uh, has been to the center of the sun and knows what the temperature or what is happening in the center of the sun in terms of fusion, nuclear reactions, etc., etc. Do you know any scientist in the world who tells you, you know, at the center of the sun, there's no nuclear fusion. This is just, you know, make believe some theory that somebody invented. There's not a single scientist in the entire world who says no sun and no star in the entire universe uh, proceeds by nuclear fusion. Everybody says, of course, it's nuclear fusion. There's no other process. And when I do the calculations with nuclear fusion, I get exactly the results that I observe when I put, uh, turn my detectors and my instruments and my telescopes to every star and every sun. So it fits. So what does that mean? It means that what I do not see is confirmed by what I see. This is called indirect. And then I add all the evidence and put it all together, and then all together it can only make sense. I forgot the name of the biologist, maybe. Uh, the, uh, the nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. Um, I'll, I'll remember his name later. When I start getting tired, my memory, my memory freezes. Uh, there's a famous biologist who said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Huh? No, not Dawkins, no, 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 some, some uh, evolutionary biologist from uh, earlier in 20th century. Anyway, doesn't matter. So what I mean is, when you put all the evidence, evidence is, first and foremost, by the way, now, today, it is the genetic evidence. It used to be that fossils and the, and the transitional fossils, et cetera, uh, and then uh, comparative um, uh, embryology uh, and uh, micro um, uh, biochemistry, biochemistry, different strands of science and all the evidence that they produce for you, you put them all together and you say, how can I explain all of this if I assume there has been no evolution and no scientist in the world will be able to explain that all series of, of evidence if you do not assume evolution. So all of it can only make sense. In addition to this idea that from species to species, this is a favorite creationist argument which is absolutely false, all right? Now, um, so how can it, how can it be uh, reconciled with the Quran, Islam, Christianity, every, every religion in the world, or at least the monotheistic religions? Uh, when, because here the question is, in the Quran there are references to the creation of Adam in heaven. You will be surprised to hear that there are a number of classical Muslim thinkers There are a number of classical Muslim thinkers who have argued centuries ago that the creation of heaven, uh, uh, creation of Adam, was not in Al Jannah, the otherworldly heaven. By the way, the word Jannah, as you all know, simply means garden. وَإِذْ دَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ قَالَ لَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا in Surah Al Kahf, which most Muslims read on Friday and today's Friday. Is that Jannah that he, the, the, the two guys were talking about was Jannah? There's many places in the Quran where Jannah refers to garden, my forest, my farm. And Muslims, commentators, centuries ago said uh, uh, Adam was not necessarily created in the metaphysical heaven. Was created in a, 
in a, in a earthly garden. Earthly garden. Do you know that there are a number of Muslim thinkers in the golden age, centuries ago, who talked and wrote about pre-Adams? Pre-Adams. That Adam was not even the first human being. <gasps> oh my God. What is he saying? I'm just telling you what was written in our books centuries ago. Don't shoot the messenger. Seriously, go read, explore, don't listen to the simplistic, you know, completely uh, stubborn stuff that we get taught, especially by the preachers. Go read. Uh, so, the fact that Adam descended from earlier species is nothing to be, sh to be shocked about. Those earlier species... By the way, there are, there are, again, in the history of the Islamic tradition, clear distinctions made between Bashar and Insan. Bashar is the earlier, less evolved, less spiritual version of Insan. And that there was this continuous evolution. And when we reach the level of Insan with the spiritual dimension, then there's this click and, oh, wait a minute, there's a vertical dimensions, like somebody who keeps walking like this and then one day realizes that, oh, there's a sky. I never saw this sky before. Oh yeah, because, because you've been walking, you know, with your head down. Now this Adam could be one person, could be a group, could be a stage of human development, then now opens up, there's now this spiritual dimension that connects him or them to God and at that stage, we become human in the Islamic or the religious sense. What's wrong with this picture? Nothing wrong with this picture. You just have to open your mind and look at things a little bit differently from what your school teachers told you. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I mean the <laughs> primary school teachers. Anyway, I've uh, been politically incorrect enough, so let me stop. Are we done or? Yeah? Ah, ah, yes, yes, yes. So, of course not. Evolution just tells you how we evolved. It doesn't tell you who you are. I told you from the beginning, and it's a good point perhaps to reconnect to what I said at the very beginning. Science never tells you who you are. It doesn't tell you why you are here. What happens to you when you die? What your beliefs should be? What your mind is? or what your consciousness is for. Science just tells you what you are, how you evolved, how you arrived here, where you come from, and perhaps beautifully, the fact that you are part of creation. You are related to everything else. And you are part of this extraordinary creation plan. And this creation plan is not some kind of a divine magician who starts saying, let me produce a human here. Let me put a, an elephant over there. It's a beautifully unfolding, you know, mind-boggling uh, creation plan worthy of a god. Not what we limited, often stupid humans imagine and want to impose. So, let's stop with that. One word, excellent. Thank you.